The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. It isn't every day that landlords and tenants agree, but they seem to right now over the need to improve the provincial tribunal that handles rental disputes. Tonight, can the landlord and tenant board be fixed? Also, from renovations to replacement rental units, we'll assess some of the province's new policies for those who live in or rent out homes. It's Tuesday, May the 2nd, and that's ahead on the agenda. For residential landlords, it's a business. For tenants, it's a home. And when tensions turn into disputes for either side, both turn to the landlord and tenant board for resolution. That's always been a difficult process, and it was made worse during the pandemic with frustratingly long backlogs. Is it well and truly broken, or is there some path forward for this troubled provincial tribunal? With us on that, Varun Sriskanda, a board member for the Small Ownership Landlords of Ontario. Jordi Dent, Executive Director, Federation of Metro Tenants Associations. Gloria Solomon, CEO of the Preston Group and Vice Chair of the Federation of Rental Housing Providers of Ontario. And Kathy Laird, she's a retired human rights lawyer and adjudicator and a spokesperson for Tribunal Watch Ontario. And it's great to have you four here in our studio tonight, where I'm sure we're going to have perfect agreement on everything we discussed. <laughs> so, well, maybe not. Let's see. Let's see. Varun, to you first. If you want a hearing these days at this tribunal, how long is the wait? Typically, if you file your application today, you can expect to get the notice of uh, your actual first hearing date will be 8 to 10 months from uh, today, the day you file. That's just for the hearing date? That's just for your first hearing date. And now, how long does, does the process take before you get a resolution? Once the hearing is actually held, yes. you have to wait for your written decision. I have some members of my of solo that are waiting up to two months for a written decision. Some people are getting written decisions in three to four weeks. But that eight to ten months, when you take into account the time you wait for the written decision, it's one year. It's a year. Well, it's one year of waiting. Is that your experience as well, Jordy, with the Federation? No, uh, actually that used to be our experience prior to the pandemic. Um, the numbers that you're hearing, tenants have been dealing with for almost a decade. Now it's even longer for tenants. Um, so, a year. Wow, we should be so lucky. We're now waiting on average 10 to 14 weeks for a hearing and a decision uh, takes just as long, even longer actually. 10 to 14 months you mean? Sorry, 10 to 14 months, yes. Right, Sorry. for a hearing and then the decision takes even longer after that. Yes, yes. Huh, okay. How about in your experience, Gloria? What do you find? Well, quite similar. I mean, it's obviously not good for the health of the industry, but we do wait. Um, if, you know, if it takes... If someone continues to live in a suite for nine months or more before even a hearing is held, and then you may have a hearing and then again wait possibly three months for a decision. Mm. And, or even if you don't, um, you know, at that point you enter not waiting for a decision, but you have, let's say, an agreement of a payment plan. Mm -hmm. And if that doesn't work out, you have to reapply for another hearing to move forward, so that can take another three months. So, so your it's, life's it's on hold for quite a while there. Quite a while. Right. Okay, we've got you here today because you're going to explain to us why is it like this? Well, first of all, I think it's important to go back and remember what it used to be like. So before 2018, this tribunal was operating pretty well. And I went back and looked at the old annual reports and at the uh, data available on the tribunal's own website. So these are their figures. It used to take 30 days from when an application was filed to when you got the order. 30 days. And frankly, for a landlord is seeking uh, an eviction for arrears, that meant that they wouldn't actually be out very much rent because they already had last month's rent. But that's so, right. That's application to decision. What about... Application what, to decision. Oh, the decision... What about decision. waiting to get in to make your application? No, there, there was no wait. There was no oh. wait. There was no wait. So and the decisions... Days. Right. And the decisions were, co were coming out... Well, that was two decisions. Decisions were, on average, about four days after hearing. Hmm. So it worked very well in 2017, 18. I went back and looked at all those three years, did the calculations, figured out the averages. What was working then that clearly isn't working now? Well, there are many things that have gone wrong. I mean, one thing that started this downward spiral was that the Ford government declined to retain and reappoint in the normal course the adjudicators that they had 
when the, after the election. So when we have an election in Ontario, we don't get rid of all the judges after an election. Why are we getting rid of all the adjudicators? This happened across Ontario tribunals, particularly at Tribunals Ontario. The Landlord and Tenant Board is part of Tribunals Ontario. So, so you're down bodies. You're down bodies. You were down at one point to 30. Right now there are close to 50 if you count up in the annual report. So there was a, a low point there. But also there were a, a lot fewer cases during the pandemic. The pandemic is not the cause of this. Hmm. Um, today we have 20,000 fewer applications coming to the tribunal. So the fewest applications ever, this is Ontario's busiest tribunal, usually 80,000 applications a year, now just over 60. So the numbers have come down as the backlog has gone up. And um, now we have already 50 adjudicators, if you add up what's in the last annual report, the government has just announced another 40. It used to work perfectly well with more applications hmm. and only 40 adjudicators. So, so Jordy, something else what, is going wrong. Okay, fill in the blanks. What's going wrong? Um, I think uh, what's going wrong is exactly what she said. If you go back to 2011, you had um, fewer app or so you had more applications, fewer adjudicators, but cases were heard faster. Now you have more adjudicators, fewer cases. Uh, they're not able to hear as many cases, and those that they are, are taking forever to take, uh, Why? forever to go. Um, I think it's um, primarily the reason that she's outlined. Um, we have a different take on this, and I'll let you know what it is. Uh, we think the Ford government uh, held back those adjudicators on purpose. Um, because, to what end? Um, to speed up evictions faster, which is exactly what they did with Bill 184. So um, our opinion is they were trying to create a crisis. They did to help uh, gut eviction preventions. And that's uh, one of the things that we're looking at now. Varun, do you think it is in the interest of this provincial government to put, uh, what's the expression I'm looking for, sand in the gears of this tribunal? No, I don't think the uh, government did that on purpose. Now, it, it, they stopped the uh, eviction of uh, tenants during the pandemic. Now, that's what created the backlog. And so we're in a position now where we have less adjudicators, fewer. less fewer adjudicators, and way more cases. Right, so we're waiting eight to ten months, and th there's no steps being taken to actually reduce that backlog. So, 40 new adjudicators that's great. How many adjudicators left their positions? How many adjudicators were fired? What, how many adjudicators are being replaced by that 40? Because we're not adding 40 new adjudicators, that number isn't really going up a lot. We're not going to see a significant reduction in that eight to 10 months, which is that magic number we need to see go down. Another great way is the infrastructure. We own, we hold leases on a significant amount of buildings that we can open doors to and start conducting hearings inside buildings, along with Zoom hearings. You get a hit a two prong. You can get rid of uh, the backlog much faster if you're hearing uh, hearings a lot quicker. Do you think the government is sabotaging this process in order to screw over tenants? No, I think that sounds ridiculous to me, honestly. I, I, I don't think it benefits landlords in any way. We are also waiting months and months and months mm -hmm. for a hearing, so I don't understand how how he can say the eviction process is, ex is expanding because of it. Um, and I want to say that there was a backlog, a significant backlog prior to the pandemic, but the pandemic certainly emphasized the backlog because everything was shut down and we could not proceed with any tribunal hearings during the pandemic. So it was just an accumulation of a backlog over a backlog. And now I don't think that there is any benefit to landlords or tenants unless, you know, to have a backlog. I'm very, very heartened to hear that there are going to be more adjudicators being brought into the system. Let me go back to Jordy on this. You don't seem to have a seconder at the table here who believes that the government is intentionally sabotaging the system in order to make life harder for tenants. Well, I've got reality. Um, bill 184, again, they sped up the eviction process. They gutted tenant protections in that, uh, in that bill. And again, part of the reason they said it was is because of the backlog of the LTB. Now, I think she just pointed out that backlog was created by the government, we all know this. They didn't hire those adjudicators. Um, so again, I, I, you know, I don't feel it's ridiculous. I feel the facts are already on the table. Go yeah, ahead, yeah. I just want to add that the backlog before this government was elected was only 13,000 cases, and it's now uh, 33,000 cases. So it hmm. is a big expansion in the backlog. The applications fell to uh, 48,000 from 80,000 during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. So, you know, other tribunals were able to get their backlogs down during the pandemic because they used the, um, you know, Zoom hearings and the, the, the decrease. Do they do that here? 
And, uh, they did move to Zoom hearings, but it didn't result in the, in the backlog going down. In fact, quite the opposite. So one of the things I want to throw on the table is the government introduced two changes, which I think are a big part of the problem. I don't know if the landlord representatives here will agree. <laughs> agree. Um, the first is they got rid of all in-person hearings mm -hmm. when the pandemic came in, and then they declined to allow in-person hearings ever again. So they say there are exceptions, but we only know of a couple of instances across Ontario where tenants with disabilities have been able to get an in-person hearing. So they everything's also, online now? Everything's online. And it used to be that there were regional in-person hearings. So there were local adjudicators, there was local clinic lawyers there to help people. Well, let me just get confirmation. Is that your understanding of things as well? Yes, and, and unfortunately that, that, that needs to change. We need to open up these doors and start having hearings in person as well as Zoom hearings. What's exactly. The, wh why would in person speed things up from the way online happens? Well, we need to do. We need to cure the cases at double the speed that we're currently hearing the cases, because we're never going to reduce the backlog if we keep hearing the same amount of cases. So if we double the workload on the adjudicators by creating, by opening up the hearing rooms and allowing in person hearings, and at the same time you have another set of adjudicators at home working on Zoom hearings, you're speeding up the backlog now. Gloria, what do you think of the online? I, I agree with that suggestion. I, I don't have a problem with the online. I think it's a modernization of the system. Mm -hmm. I think it helps both landlords and tenants uh, avoid the necessary travel to go to a tribunal and, and show up. And, and most people, I, I, would, I would argue, have a computer at home or access to a computer right. that but they do can do both? this. You need both online and in person? I think that would help for the backlog. I think that, that's, that's an option that should be maintained. Okay. Kathy, pick it up. If you yeah. Uh, other tribunals have done that. The Social Security Tribunal federally, the Workers' Compensation Tribunal here, they allow people the choice of in person or online. Uh, of course, for some people it will be more convenient, but this is a high volume tribunal. There are 30 to 40 matters in a hearing block. People are trying to phone in to connect. Um, the, the, the staff are that a lot of people who are low-income people, rural households, don't have internet access or don't have good internet access. Mm -hmm. So they struggle to connect to their hearings. More than half the tenants are coming on to their hearings by phone, whereas the landlord and the adjudicator are on a video hearing. So you're at a disadvantage and the stakes are so high. This model just doesn't work. And I, I agree completely, there, it should become optional. It should always be optional. It is a modernization, but it isn't working well. And I think that's why we can't get through this backlog. Okay, let me, Sheldon, you wanna put this graphic up top of page two here? And for those who are listening on podcast, I'm gonna describe this uh, mountain that we're about to look at here. This is the wait times for the most common landlord and tenant cases. And they're broken up into four things. This is landlord cases where evictions are due to a failure to pay the rent. And then that's the blue line at the bottom. Then you've got landlord cases, evictions for other reasons. You've got tenants cases for rights violations. And you've got tenants cases for lapsed maintenance. And things kind of go, we start the clock here in 2000 and, what is that, 16. And things kind of go along tickety-boo. It's a fairly flat line uh, until you get just before the pandemic. And then suddenly the numbers start to go up and it's like bumping into a mountain. And the tenant cases really go through the roof and the landlord cases that are being brought go up, you know, significantly, but then start to level out and come down. So tenant cases, uh, really seem to be a, a problem post-pandemic here. And I guess, uh, Jordy, why don't we start by having you weigh in on that. Why is the wait so much longer for tenants than it is for landlords? Um, because the Landlord and Tenant Board is a landlord-friendly institution. 91% of all applications to Landlord and Tenant Board are made by landlords. Uh, and if you see the, the graph, you'll note that- Sheldon, tenant let's bring it up again, Sheldon. Tenant applications have always been longer um, for the entire history. Um, even though they make up the fewest number of applications, even though tenants make up way more of a population than landlords do. Uh, again, the, the landlord and tenant board has always been geared to landlords, unfortunately. And it's always, now, even when the liberals and NDP were in power? Even when the liberals and NDP were in power, absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, again, it's been a landlord institution. The applications tell the whole story, right? If it was 50-50, we'd have a balanced system. 90% landlords, wait times that are just ridiculous for tenants now going into a year, totally separating from landlords. They're second class in this kind of scenario. It just, uh, Gloria, I know you want in there, but just, just for the record here, the, the landlords are waiting, looks like 25 days at the beginning of this chart. 
and by the end of the chart, it's up to a, about 125 days. So it's up, but the tenants start at 50 days and are up to a year by the end of it. Yes, but like Jordy said, there's a very, very small number of tenant applications compared to landlord applications. So you can argue that it has not been friendly to the landlords. There have been many, <laughs> many, many waits for the landlord. And it's not in the landlord's best interest to even go to the LTB. I mean, in a perfect world, we, we would not want to even apply to the LTB. We do it out of necessity for non-payment of rent uh, by, a, by a resident or for disturbances to other people in the building. So they're all valid reasons to go into the tenancy board for resolution. The tenant cases are much smaller and fewer and far between. So. Do you think, the, the, uh, Varun, do you think the fix is in at, the, at this tribunal in favor of landlords, as Jordy suggests? No, the board favors tenants. If the board favored landlords, we wouldn't be able, we would be able to recover rent money. If I made an application and I said my tenant hasn't paid rent in three months, the board would have some option. For example, the tenant should pay the rent into trust to the board. And then we could say that the, the, it's a balanced system, but the uh, board favors the tenants by allowing them to go one year without payment of rent. And then when you get to the board and you get to the hearing and you uh, outline to the adjudicators the level of fraud and deceit that took place to secure the housing, such as forged credit scores, forged identity documents, forged pay stubs, forged job letters. How much of that goes on? A lot of that goes on. There's a lot of that. Many, many applic L1 applications are due to professional tenants who are using forged identity documents L1, in order just, to just secure... Just a little housing. jargon there. Yes. L1 or landlord cases, evictions due to lack of rent. Non-payment of rent, yes. Yeah. So those are professional tenants. They use identity documents to get in the house and then use landlord tenant board backlogs to their advantage. All right, I got to let Jordy respond. Um, yeah, I think uh, estimates are saying about... 30,000 to 50,000 landlords in Ontario every year are committing eviction fraud. Uh, again, the cases do not reflect that at all at the landlord and tenant board. Um, I believe FERPO has done a couple of studies on how much tenants pay their rent overall. And I believe the figure in both times is about 98.6% of rent is collected by landlords. I could not get any tenant to have 98.6% of their rights uh, given to them by a landlord. Landlords repeatedly do not do maintenance. They repeatedly harass their tenants. These are cases that should be at the landlord and tenant board, but they're not because well, it's so difficult. Hang on. Okay. I want to ask you about that. Yeah. About 85% of the cases before this tribunal are brought by landlords. Yes. Mm -hmm. Why? Why are tenants not bringing more cases if because you have more Because it's, it's not accessible to them. Uh, they have to take a day off work, which most of them can't do. Most of them are not legally trained. They don't have lawyers, assets, lobby groups supporting them. Um, they've got... Well, you know, you're a lobby group supporting them. We're not a lobby group. <laughs> we're a very small, small tenants' rights agency nope. that gets like a pittance compared to, I think, a single member of FERPO. Uh, we are operating a shoestring budget trying to help people against a very well-organized, powerful, and moneyed force, which is landlords. Um, and again, we're doing our best... Um, but again, it's really stacked against tenants. Kathy, you want in? Yeah, there's always bad landlords, there's always bad tenants. They're both out there, they're mm -hmm. not the majority. Most landlords are trying to provide decent housing, especially small landlords. Okay. Um, and most uh, tenants just want to live somewhere. They, if they have a, a leaky roof, they actually, they have busy lives, right? They don't necessarily want to run off and get it fixed. It's the board, the landlord and tenant board, and this government and the leadership at Tribunals Ontario that is letting both sides down. I mean, the, the situation that Varun mentioned about waiting a year for rent, that's only because the tribunal has not managed to bring that hearing forward. If they brought it forward within 25 days at the beginning of your graph, then the tenant would either pay up or be out and the landlord would be coasting on their last month's rent. This is how it used to work. Okay, but theoretically, admittedly, this is only theoretically, if you've got an agency, if you've got a tribunal that is looking at complaints from landlords and tenants, you would assume that the applications would be 50-50 between landlords and tenants. It's 85-15. Uh, well, no, it's because uh, it, uh, tenants, uh, there's an affordability crisis. Lots of tenants are not able to pay their rent. This has historically been the case in Ontario that all the, the applications, the vast majority, are always landlord applications. Mm -hmm. Now, in the old days when people were in an in-person hearing, many of these cases were settled. Tenant duty council was present in, per, in, in person. There was the municipal rent bank there. You know, I'm in Sudbury. My legal clinic's here. My rent bank's here. My housing inspector can testify about what's going on. It used to work really well. And all of that is out the window. Now we have tenants 
tenants phoning in, landlords online, waiting sometimes hours for their matter to come up while they hold the phone. The tenants run out of me minutes on their plan, waiting for the hearing to come up. Gloria, you no, want I it. agree with everything Kathy's saying. It's making a lot of sense. I mean, if someone is not paying rent and continues to live in a, in a suite for nine or ten months, I mean, it affects business. It affects the landlord. It's not the same level of care and maintenance that we can afford but to how maintain. How common is that, where you have somebody who doesn't pay for nine or ten months? Well, it's a lot more common than people who are complaining about their landlord issues at the tribunal, I'll tell you. <laughs> it's very skewed. There's a lot more people who are suffering from not being able to pay the rent than they are suffering from the tenant's uh, lack of maintenance in their units. Okay. So We can agree for in the, that a year to dispose of these issues is too long. What's a reasonable amount of time that we should wait to have these issues dealt with? 30 days. Yeah. 30 Once, days is doable? 30 days. Once you file an application at the board, you need to have your hearing in 30 days. And if you had a hearing in 30 days, uh, two things would happen. One, there would be a significant reduction in the amount of tenants using fraudulent documents to secure housing. There's no incentive anymore, right? Mm -hmm. Once you uh, get the housing, you know that I can be evicted in 30 days with non-payment. So let's just make sure we pay rent. A second thing is uh, you're going to uh, have more tenants that pay rent on time. Right? There's, they don't want to be evicted. They know that it's no longer eight to 10 months. You can't use LTB backlogs to your advantage. They will take the steps necessary to work with their landlord, create payment plans. And many small landlords I know are currently in payment arrangements with their tenants. There's significant arrears, but we keep the tenants in the unit and we work with them to pay back the arrears and keep, keep up with the current rent. So the landlords say 30 days, it ought to be enough time to get it all done. What do you say? Has it ever been 30 days for a tenant? Ever? Has it ever been 30 days for a tenant? Ever? I don't know. You tell us. No. Uh, you know, in 2018, uh, the tenants from 42 Glen Elm took their landlord to the Wait, landlord sorry, board. We go across the province. Where's that? 42 Glen Elm was downtown Toronto. Okay. Okay. Um, they took their landlord to the board saying, landlord's trying to take away our storage lockers. That case was resolved this year, in 2023. It took six years for that case to work its way through the courts for tenants to get justice. No one cared. There was no television show saying, oh, God, tenants are waiting so long for justice. Um, tenants have been facing these delays for years. It's not an issue. Um, when landlords are finally facing the same delays that tenants are facing, it's a problem. So well, I'm fine with 30 days if you can get tenants 30 days. But last but I, that's last, not a priority okay, for anyone. Let's just check this, though. I mean, last I checked, there is an opposition at Queen's Park um, who I, I certainly know liberals and Democrats and Greens go to bat for tenants all the time. Mm -hmm. Are they not doing an adequate job bringing these issues to the fore? I mean, they're, they're bringing the issues to the fore, um, but in our experience, you've got a government that's basically a landlord government. Like, they don't even talk to any tenant groups. I know FERPO uh, meets with the government regularly. I assume Solo has met with the government regularly. Uh, they will not meet with us. Uh, and they will not meet with us because they frankly don't care. Like, they don't really care about the tenant experience. They've got big friends going to the stag and doe who are at the landlord groups. Uh, we weren't invited. <laughs> the the, the name of the silly. bill is called Protecting Tenants. <laughs> yes. so the name of Bill 97 is called Protecting Tenants, not Protecting Landlords and Tenants. Uh, bill 984 was, was it, uh, the book, 1984, <laughs> worse, worse, you know, worse piece. Well, yeah, you know, you call it whatever you want. The, the full really name of the bill is Helping Home Buyers and Protecting, protecting Tenants. tenants. Yes. Yeah. Well, It'd be nice if we could protect some landlords as well. I have a lot of small landlords who need protection from... Um, fraudulent tenants from uh, unscrupulous tenants who are taking advantage of backlogs and are essentially stealing housing. But the point you made earlier, 30 days would work. There wouldn't be an incentive for fraud. Yeah. There wouldn't be an incentive to withhold rent. Absolutely. Right. It's, it's, the, it's the Landlord and Tenant Board and Tribunals Ontario that is letting both sides down. I agree with Jordy so that I, it's yeah. always served, ten, tenant interests have always moved much more yes. slowly through the process. But Th that it works for it, it's better for tenants as well mm -hmm. if the process works quickly on all applications right. mm -hmm. and that includes absolutely if applications. existing non pay payers remain in their units then those units are not available for new people who want to come and rent apartments mm -hmm. I, yes and I, I think when we, we I don't think we should date the backlog problem from the pandemic when no. applications went way down I think we have to date it from when this government came in when they they let go all the adjudicators yes. but also so the leadership is taking us down a path that isn't functional. Everyone at this table has said that we need in-person hearings, but the government is doubling down. When they announced the new 6.5 million or whatever and hiring 40 new adjudicators, they also said none of these adjudicators will ever travel to a hearing 
There used to be 44 hearing locations in this province. So it's all Zoom now. It's mm -hmm. all Zoom. They will they will never hold an in-person hearing. So they are and they're giving tenants phones to join their hearings because they don't have computers and they don't have phones. So mm -hmm. that is doubling down on a model that frankly also delivers a lesser standard of justice to both sides. Let me ask Vernon about the other side of the coin though. Are, are, if a landlord is in trouble financially because a tenant misses one or two months rent, does that suggest to you that the landlord has taken on a project and or debt level that is ill-advised? Absolutely not. When landlords got into this, they were looking at the Landlord and Tenant Board website and the Landlord and Tenant Board's own service standards, which I believe is still 30 days that, that they'd like to uh, issue yeah. notices of hearings. I, I can't believe they haven't edited the text on that website, but their service standards are still 30 days. So if I'm a landlord and I wanna get into this business, I got into it thinking that the province, that the courts, that the, the, the tribunals are operating the way they should be. We don't need a system that favors tenants and we don't need a system that favors landlords. We need a level playing field and we don't even have that at the moment all right let me ask Jordy the other side of that coin which is I know there is or there has been a tendency to be able to portray all landlords as these big evil greedy multinational huge companies when the fact is a lot of them are just mom-and-pop operations you know a couple units on the side maybe they're immigrants maybe this is their first attempt to try to run a business or something like that do you have any sympathy for that scenario sure I know a lot of investors that suffer from investment risk. It happens, right? You invest in something, it goes down. Uh, you don't make the money you thought you were gonna make. I understand for a lot of people this is their life savings, it's a business for them. Um, but at the end of the day, I don't know too many landlords, I've certainly never encountered one in the news that has totally lost their property um, from a rental scenario snafu. But I meet every day, I I every know, day, know, um, you know, people like tents filled in the parks in the city of Toronto. All right, that's the constituency I represent. Uh, and that constituency has been absolutely hammered at a time when pro landlord profit margins have never been higher. Um, so again, I, you know, I want to see balance. I want to see a balanced situation, but it's not balanced right now at all. Do you have any sympathy for tenants who find themselves, through no fault of their own, unable to pay their rents? Maybe they absolutely. Get fired, maybe well, they... during the pandemic, I mean, Kathy said the number of cases went down. That's because landlords on the whole did not proceed to apply to the tribunal because of the pandemic. We were we were encouraged by our, our association and just being good good industry leaders to work with our residents, come up with payment plans. Well, the government told you you couldn't. That was part of it too, right? Right. So yes. that's why there was no. But we also went into payment plans and structured our, our outstanding debt so that people can, once they get back on their feet, they can clear their balances. Our intention was not to go to the landlord and tenant board mm -hmm. to proclaim it because we need our cash. I mean, rent payments is the, is the revenue that allows a building to operate. Yeah. And as, as they get stalled or as they're not collected, uh, I don't know where Jordy's getting the idea that landlords are making record profit margins. I mean, that's not, that's, that's, that's fallacy. It's not true at all. All right, we've got several minutes left here. Let's look at, you. you've both laid out, uh, both sides have laid out the arguments as to what the difficulties are. What can we fix here? What's an easy fix? Where's the low hanging fruit that we can fix here? Well, I, I think the first thing is that we have um, a problem with the government and with uh, Tribunals Ontario that the Landlord Tenant Board is under, realizing there's a problem. So in the last annual report, the head of Tribunals Ontario said that the, uh, its tribunals, including the Landlord and Tenant Board, was well on the way to being recognized as one of the best tribunals in North America. And he also said, we put access to justice at the center of everything we do. Are either of those things true? They are. You, the, everyone on this panel agrees. None of that is happening. So we have a disconnect. And I guess the government is buying that line and believes the tribunal is working and that this new method will, will click into place. But that's not the experience. The backlog goes up. Fewer people are using the tribunal. 20,000 fewer cases last year. That's because the tribunal has no credibility. I think the first stage, well, we know what the answer is. We actually have to go back to some of the features of the former system, which everyone here agrees was working. 
30 days, 28 mm -hmm. days to get from filing. Now, I, I take your point that we need improvements on the tenant mm -hmm. side as well, but the process worked a lot better. So we need to go back to some of those things, in-person hearings, regional hearings, so that Tenant Duty Council can help people, so that rent banks are available, so rent gets paid. Um, it's, it's not rocket science. The, the government shut down the stakeholder advisory committees at every tribunal, so the Landlord and Tenant Board used to have experts from the tenant side and the landlord side doing real consultation. When I was at the Tenant Duty Council program many years ago, when we introduced it, we sat down with the tribunal and devised the forms together because it's in the landlord's interest also that tenants know where they can get help so they know if their rights are not going to take them where they want to go or what their rights are. So that was shut down. We need to open up that again. A recognition of the problem, reverting to some of the features that are tried and true, and opening the doors to real consultation. All right, Jordy, keeping in mind. I'd like to hear recommendations from you, but keeping in mind, we got to have win-wins here, right? Can't just be good for tenants, can't just be good for landlords. We need win-win. For example, um, I, I think uh, bringing back uh, regional centers would be great, and so counter you agree service, 100 percent. Uh, count in-person counter service is absolutely critical. I have talked to so many seniors in their 70s and 80s facing an eviction hearing, just having no idea what to do. Uh, no idea how to present evidence on a phone, no idea how to use a computer in Zoom. Um, so again, they need in-person service. But there's a couple other things that I think could be really helpful. Please. Um, the Social Security Tribunal has like a navigator program mm -hmm. uh, to try to help people navigate the system. I think that's desperately needed right now for people because you're going to get, I, I encounter small landlords that have no idea what they're doing and um, trying to figure it out as they come to the tribunal. But more importantly, a lot of tenants really need that kind of support to navigate the system. Um, you can also expand Service Ontario service. Um, they've had like a lot of applications there. Um, again, I think that's been successful. And another thing that they could look at improving the system. Okay, Varun, what would you like to see change? One of the first things I'd like is if we started uh, separating small landlords from the corporate landlords. Now, uh, a landlord that has one rental unit cannot take a hit the way a landlord that has 100 rental units. If one of those rental units starts defaulting, that's okay. You can offset those losses with another 99 rental units. Mm -hmm. But many of the members at Solar are suffering serious financial harm at the moment because they have one to two rental units. They're, you know the cost of, of interest rate and inflation today. It, the mortgage rates are through the roof. Utilities are through the roof. In which case, let me do a fast follow-up. If you're only solo, small ownership landlords of Ontario, Correct. if you've only got one or two units and one of your tenants is a problem and therefore your cash flow is 50% off or 100% off, mm -hmm. why not sell? Selling isn't an option either. We got into this business to provide housing. That's a lot of the members at Solo take great pride in being able to provide housing to newcomers, to immigrants, to international students who suffer very, who have a difficult time finding housing in this country. We take great pride in being able to rent to them. We don't want to be out of the business. We want to be in it. We want to buy more rental units, but we need a system that at least gives us the ability to evict problematic tenants. Okay, Gloria, how about you? What change uh, would you like to see? First of all, I'd like to say as, as a, a board member of FERPA, I would just say our industry is very pleased to hear that the Ontario government is investing in the landlord and tenant board. I think it's long overdue, and I think the fact that they are in, uh, investing all this extra funds in it is a, is a positive step to improving the system. Um, I, I think the plan to hire more members and adjudicate cases is a, is a, is a benefit. And I think the online uh, access is, is modernization of a system that can help um, access for everybody. And although it would be necessary to maintain tribunals in some centers for people who are unable to access online, but I think the process, but the process can be speeded up and saving money by d moving a lot of things online yeah. when not necessary to go and waste a whole day sitting in a tribunal office for your 10 minutes of your case that may come up. Kathy, um, I got 30 seconds left. It took years to get into the soup. 
How long is it going to take to get out of the soup? Well, I, I think the answers are pretty easy to implement and that the, the government, the, the tribunal itself could move quickly. It could move quickly to make in-person and regional hearings an option, something that is available for people who don't have internet. And that, you can manage a, that hearing block much better in an in-person hearing. So yes, move back to that and open your doors and invite people in. We had a, a fair amount of agreement around this table. Indeed, on some we got issues. consensus on that. that yes, was good. exactly. So that's uh, what we do here, Kathy. We bring people together. <laughs> and with that, I want to thank all four of you for coming into TVO tonight. Kathy Laird, the aforementioned Tribunal Watch Ontario, Jordy Dent from the Federation of Metro Tennis Associations, Gloria Solomon, CEO of the Preston Group, Vice Chair of the Federation of Rental Housing Providers of Ontario, and Varun Sriskanda, Solo Small Ownership Landlords of Ontario. Thanks all for coming Thank into you. TVO. We appreciate your time. Thank you. Amid an affordable housing crisis, last month the province outlined steps it was taking to, quote, make life easier, stabler, and more predictable for tenants and landlords alike. Among those steps were promised protections against evictions for renovations, so-called renovictions, and a plan to build a framework for municipal rental replacement bylaws for when tenants lose their units due to redevelopment. With us now for more, in the nation's capital, Carolyn Weitzman, housing researcher and adjunct geography professor at the University of Ottawa, and here in our studio, Tony Irwin, President and CEO of the Federation of Rental Housing Providers of Ontario. And it's good to have you two back together on this program. We had you both here uh, just a few months back. Let us go into some of the details here just to get our viewers and listeners up to scratch on Bill 97, the so-called Helping Homebuyers Protecting Tenants Act. Sheldon, why don't you bring this graphic up and we'll go through some of the nuts and bolts here. Bill 97 includes new investments in the Landlord and Tenant Board, which we have discussed in length in the other part of tonight's program. If you missed that and you want to catch up on it, our website, tvo.org, or our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash the agenda, and you can see all the fun you missed if you didn't watch the whole show. Allowing all tenants the right to install an air conditioning unit, provided they meet some new criteria. Stricter rules for renovations when a tenant is evicted for renovations. Doubling fines for offenses such as bad faith evictions, making this province's fines the highest in Canada, and standardizing rental replacement bylaws, the municipal rules requiring developers to rebuild any rental units they knock down for a new building. Let's start with a little, Carolyn, to you first, a little truth in advertising here. It's called the Protecting Tenants. That's in the Act's name, Protecting Tenants. In your view, does it do that? Look, there are some good measures in Bill 97, but the bottom line is that we need a vast scaling up of social housing. That was the last time I was here. And purpose-built rental. And everyone, tenants, developers, etc., they need certainty. And what's been happening is that the provincial government has been throwing stuff at a wall without some clear ideas about what it's going to take to build affordable housing where it needs to be built. All right, Tony, how about for you? Truth in Advertising says helping home buyers and protecting tenants. Does it do that? I think absolutely there are some, some quite a number, as you outlined in the top, uh, measures in the Act that do strengthen protections for tenants. We've always advocated for it before, uh, an environment that does provide strong tenant protections, but also an environment that allows for a strong operating climate for rental housing providers. I think this legislation does uh, do some things that are helpful for tenants, and uh, well, Carolyn, I'm happy to get into conversations about how we can get more purposeful rental built. We know how important that is, but to your point, yes, I do think there are some stronger protections in the bill. Carolyn, these things are always about a balance, right? I mean, you can't go too far in tenant protection and screw over landlords, and similarly, you can't do the opposite as well. So it's about finding the balance. Do you think this bill finds the balance? Well, no. I think that, again, in terms of certainty, uh, Quebec has had twice the rate of purpose-built uh, rental for couple of decades now than Ontario uh, with rent control and I think that it's really and rent protections being stronger in Quebec it's really important to just kind of settle down and to have similar definitions of what affordable housing is what uh, we need to do in order to bring rents down to the level that are affordable because the bottom line is we need homes that are affordable for uh, the people who are living there and and every other bit of policy needs to be designed in that way. 
All right, Tony, how about you on the issue of whether you find the balance in this bill? Well, as we know, Steve, there, are been, there have been a number of housing supply action plan bills. This is HSAP 4.0. Uh, I think there'll be a 5.0 coming in the fall. Uh, so it's really been a series of legislation, series of bills and measures aimed to do a number of things. No one bill is going to do everything we need. Is there balance in this bill? Well, I think there is relative to what's in this particular legislation. Now, let me just stop you there. Sure. Should tenants be nervous if the guy representing the landlord says, yes, I find this to be a balanced bill? Well, I mean, I think uh, when I, no, they shouldn't be nervous. I don't believe they should be nervous. We, again, advocate for a system that's fair, a system that is is, is clear, uh, a system that does make sense for all sides. I think this does that. Is this going to solve all of our problems? No. But do I think this, this is incremental progress? Yes, I think it is. Let's go through some of the nuts and bolts here, Carolyn. How have rental replacement wor uh, rules worked until now? Well, in Toronto, we'll take Toronto as an example, though Ottawa could also be an example, or Hamilton. Uh, when a uh, building is torn down, the idea is that uh, accommodation will be made for the tenant to be able to return at the same rent to a similar size of building. I mean, it's, it's kind of clunky, to be honest, but at the same time, one of the big problems is zoning, because there are so few places where apartment buildings can be built. Generally, condos, for a whole bunch of reasons, including federal policy, have been more attractive to developers. And so you're talking about a very scarce resource, which is always a really bad idea when a third of Canadian households are dependent on uh, rental. Half of the population of Toronto is dependent on rental. And yet, where is the concentrated effort to get lots more rental in places? No, I get like you. Carolyn, I, 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 I get that that's the... I get that's the note you're hitting on today, but I want to be specific on this question. You've told us how rental replacement rules have worked in the past. Tony, tell us how they would change under this new bill. Well, I think the biggest way they would change is to bring in some greater consistency and clarity around the rules that exist today. So right now, uh, you know, the, the rules are inconsistent. Uh, of course, only a few municipalities actually have rental replacement bylaws right now. Toronto and Mississauga, I believe, uh, don't. Uh, maybe I'm not 100% right on that, but they aren't. They don't exist everywhere. So should they? So, or are, will well, this I expand. Well, I think the point is that you know, if, if municipalities are going to choose to have bylaws in this area, there should be some consistency around how they're applied how it works because you know we have members who do want to uh, build more rental housing personal rental housing and they are uh, looking at buildings that are quite old uh, and and you look at options and at some point the best option is to bring it down it's not great for people living there to be displaced but at some point everything has a lifespan and that's really the best option so how do you do it that's fair how do you do it in a way that is consistent uh, you know our, our people who are in this industry need clarity and they need certainty around the rules that's what this will do and I think that's helpful for, uh, for, for residents to understand how the rules will work and for those who are building to know how they'll work and they can all work together. Okay, Carolyn, to, then to your... Yes, yeah, please uh, jump in on that. Jump in. I don't disagree with Tony at all. Uh, I think that consistency and clarity is super important. But I also think that at the bill proposes a complaints driven process as opposed to a process that's part of the actual applying to rebuild. And I am the first person to say that it's an overly onerous process to um, uh, uh, do a development application at any municipality in Ontario right now. But I am equally concerned about a complaints-driven process. For instance, food is an essential. If we said, wow, we need more restaurants, um, but we're not going to be doing health inspections, um, that would be a problem, you know, rats for the win. <laughs> did you just say rats for the win? I did. <laughs> that was very clever. Okay, very good. Uh, all right, if you don't think the complaints-based process is the way to go, what would you prefer to see in its place? I'd prefer to see an approach that tries to get more rental housing where there's a lot of amenity and a lot of um, uh, capacity to scale. Part of the problem with the current provincial government's approach is they're just generic supply is going to be the simplistic solution. That's simply not true. Uh, sprawl in uh, East Gwillimbury, the fastest growing municipality in Canada, isn't necessarily going to meet the need of a personal support worker in Toronto or in Peel. So I think that there needs to be much more steering from the 
the provincial government if it's interested in steering towards getting the right supply in the right places and preferably at some of the right costs. Okay, Tony, help us understand how this works. If, if a landlord, for example, wants to renovate a building or alternatively take it down because, as you say, the lifespan has mm. run its course and you need a new building in place, mm. what is the obligation of the landlord to the tenants who live in that building while the renovations or the rebuilding is taking place? So there are different rules apply in different scenarios, as you've as you've uh, pointed or explained. So if you are renovating a unit, for example, and uh, the renovations are significant enough that you need you require vacant possession, so that's one example where, uh, in that case, the rental housing provider goes to the resident and says, "We are we, we have to do these major renovations. Uh, it's not possible to do it while you are living in the unit." So then, of course, there are rules that govern uh, notice periods need to be given, uh, compensation, and this bill does provide additional protections in that area to say that gives tenants a, a longer period of time once the renovation is completed uh, to be able to return to that unit because uh, I think as you know at the end of that process uh, the the resident should they wish is to be able to return to that right. unit uh, at, what, the, at the pre, at the prior rent. What's the landlord's obligation in terms of a comparable unit to move into while the renovations are happening? Well so while the renovations are happening uh, and, you know the way it, the, the the landlord's responsibility is either to uh, what happens is either compensation is given to end the tenancy in which case the tenant then find somewhere else to live, takes a certain amount of compensation, hopefully find somewhere else to live, or uh, they don't do that and they, in this scenario they, they find somewhere else to live. We, would, we always encourage our, our members to help uh, their, their resident in that situation find somewhere else to live. Perhaps they've got another unit they can offer them, they can help them with another provider, find somewhere else that they can live during the time of the renovation. The legislation uh, currently that we're talking about dictates that if it's passed, uh, that no uh, updates need to be given during the renovation. A, a qualified person has to indicate that, in fact, vacant possession is required. These are the stronger protections that I am alluding was alluding to earlier, or my belief that they are, uh, to say this is all what will be required going forward and then at the end of that again the resident if they want to come back uh, they've got now additional time if they need to give notice somewhere else they've been living for example and they want to return to that unit that's now renovated at the prior rent there's no system that's perfect and can allow can, can sort of foresee every sort of uh, every sort of kink uh, that could occur but it's meant to say this unit's being renovated it requires significant renovations will help you in the meantime either you can leave and we'll give you uh, you know we'll, we'll, we'll give you an amount to to sort of end your tenancy voluntarily or we'll help you during that interim period and then see if you want to come back and we'll try to facilitate that okay. too. Carolyn in your judgment are those protections adequate for tenants? Absolutely not. So we've just shifted from talking about dem eviction, which is fairly straightforward. We're going to demolish this building. We're hopefully going to rebuild it with the same number of affordable units, etc., to rent eviction. Rent eviction is one of the increasing excuses used to get out tenants from rent controlled units in order to bring in tenants um, at a new price at a three or four times the uh, cost. So um, there's a, a, a number of uh, studies that have looked at rent eviction, which is a relatively, let's put it this way, the extent to which it's being used right now is relatively new and shows that only about 5% of the rent evictions needed to, in other words, people needed to, to move out. Um, I think that it's really important to point out, for instance, that the vacancy rate for units under 1,200 a month in Ottawa is 0.06%. So this idea that the benevolent landlord will be helping a tenant to find a cheap place to live in the same area of the same size is is nonsense. Um, there are good builders out there, uh, both the non-market and market, who are able to move tenants into another building um, to, to sequence renovations, for instance, so move tenants into a, a nearby building, do the renovations and then move them back fairly quickly. That would be a much more humane uh, model. But I think I just heard Tony say that when, or when an eviction has to take place in order to renovate a building, the tenants do have the opportunity, once the renovations are done, to move back in at the same rent. Did I hear you say that? Correct. Okay. So what am I missing here then, Carolyn? Well, then Tony started talking about some other 
alternatives. And again, this is a complaint-driven process. So a lot of tenants will, in the absence of knowledge of their rights, take a small package and move out or take a small package and be uh, sent to, um, or I shouldn't say sent, um, will we'll hopefully uh, uh, find a place that's affordable in the same area? Probably not. So again, with a complaint-driven model, this sort of benevolent notion of a paternalistic landlord who will help you out is a little bit not grounded in reality. Um, the possibility of renovicting uh, tenants is really one of the many ways that we're showing a net loss of affordable housing. We've lost 550,000 homes across Canada, renting at less than 750 a month from 2011 to 2021. The only reason why the rate is slowing down is because there's very few homes left that are at 750 a month or less, and yet 80% of the households that are in core housing need need rents at less than 750. So again, the real question is, how are we going to scale up affordable units? Hmm. And, and I think there's a lot of things that Tony and I can agree on about scaling up purpose-built rental. Um, I think that there's a lot that can happen in terms of um, tax and other mechanisms to support scaling up purpose-built rental, which is desperately needed in most of Canada's big cities, including Toronto, um, uh, surrounding area, um, Ottawa, et cetera. But, um, oh, I, I hear I you, but I'm going to jump in here because I want to be the, I want to be the okay. devil involved in the details here. And I want to, sure. I just want to make sure I understand, Tony, how this mm -hmm. works, which is, let's say you've got a two bedroom, 1200 square foot for argument's sake, apartment, mm -hmm. and you've got to move out because they want to do, the landlord wants to do some renovating. Is the obligation in the new act upon the landlord to find you a similar 1,200 square foot two bedroom place, or could it be, for example, an 800 square foot two bedroom place? So, if you're what you're talking about, the, the there are there's not one path for how this will how this will work. Uh, it is based on the the resident and the provider, obviously having some conversations around what's going to happen. There are a number of options. One is agreeing to end the tenancy and providing compensation for that. Another is uh, providing the the opportunity for the the resident to move back at the end. In terms of obligations to find them somewhere else during that time, that's not currently required. We certainly encourage our members to help. Uh, the residents do that, but in terms of the the way it is now and what this bill will will do if passed, it's it strengthens uh, the amount of time that's required or sorry that's given to a resident to 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 essentially assert their their right to come back after. Do you think it's a big pro would it be a problem if the bill had in fact insisted that there is an obligation on the landlord to find alternative housing arrangements for somebody they have to evict because of renovations? I think it's a challenge for the reasons that we all know, which is that we, we need a lot more supply. And as Carol and I can agree on that, we do need a lot more supply of all different types that can suit all different needs. So that would be a challenge. Some providers are better able to do that uh, because of their, you know, their portfolio, they have other units uh, because they're larger. Others would be more challenged. If you're a smaller operator, you might not have, it might be more difficult for you to be able to provide that unit. So there has to be balance to how this works and and in terms of you know demolishing a building the rules for that the whole I mean, what we were talking about earlier uh, that the rules around that of course are different again if you're bringing a building down trying to to harmonize the rules around how that works uh, today it can be if you're demolishing a building you might you're required to give compensation you might be you're, you might be required to have to pay for a move out and a move into another unit mm -hmm. pay a rent differential if the rent is greater somewhere else uh, and then pay to bring bring that resident back okay. there are a lot of different parts of that that need to be simplified sure Carolyn, let me get you to just help us understand sort of the real-life predicament when this happens. Uh, we know there's not enough supply out there, so we know that when some tenants get evicted because of renovations or the building's being taken down entirely, there's nowhere else to go. So, I mean, you've, you've heard the stories. What do people do when they're evicted and they really have nowhere else to go? What happens? 
Well, I was speaking to someone, a, a city councilor the other day, who uh, was dealing with a former tenant who was moving into a shelter and had to give up her dog. So homelessness is obviously the worst case scenario, and chronic homelessness has doubled between 2060, uh, 2018 and 2022. So we're dealing with a housing and homelessness emergency. I'd also be interested in hearing from Tony, and I'm not saying this as a gotcha or anything like that, but the Federation of um, Planning Commissioners of Ontario has estimated that 1.2 million homes in Ontario, very close to the 1.5 that's the target, have been approved but haven't yet been constructed. So one thing that's happening is with construction and labour shortages and a lot of uncertainty about interest rates, etc. there's a huge construction lag. So you can be told, oh yeah, we're just going to renovate or we're going to tear down your building and uh, rebuild in a year, but now it's closer to five or six years by which time your child might have grown up, et cetera. You might have different needs. So, I mean, the, the, the rate of construction right now is very low. And I'm not saying at all that it's the fault of developers or landlords. I'm just saying that until that's addressed, it's a bit of an empty promise to say, yeah, you can come back. Tony, last minute to you. So I think in terms of that point, obviously there are a number of factors that go into how this all works. Uh, you know, we know that labor, short labor is an issue. Trying to find skilled trades to do the work is an issue, uh, for sure. Construction costs, costs involving construction may be different now than they were when you started the process. So while you might have permits in place, uh, the, the economics might be more challenging today to actually build that project than they were when you started. So there are, there are a number of issues around, you know, what's, what the status of a project is and why it's not being constructed. No doubt, we need to get a lot more building uh, going, right? I mean, I think everyone agrees with that. And, and in my world, purposeful rental is something that we really need much more of. Now, we're coming off a couple of years of, of stronger numbers. Not, not strong enough to get us where we need to be in terms of the targets, but certainly moving in the right direction. So we need to sort of obviously all work together uh, and when it comes to inflation and interest rates. That affects whether projects can go forward now versus maybe remembering that the process might have started for someone five years ago. Uh, now they may have all their permits in place, but everything could, there could be a lot could be very different now than when it was then. Mm -hmm. So we really hope that we can move to a better uh, place. We can get more trades in place. We can hopefully stabilize the economy, and we're able to really get shovels in the ground and start building. I'm always interested when we do landlord-tenant issues on this program because uh, the two of you uh, represent very different interests. On the other hand, you both need each other in order to <laughs> succeed. So. Uh, we enjoy the conversations that emerge. Carolyn Weitzman uh, from the University of Ottawa, Tony Irwin, Federation of Rental Housing Providers of Ontario. Thanks uh, to both of you for having such a civilized discussion here on TVO tonight. We're grateful. Thank you, Tony and Steve. Thank you, Carol. See you again. Absolutely. <laughs>And that is the agenda for Tuesday, May 2nd, 2023. Can you have religion without God? We'll reflect on that tomorrow. I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at tvo.org, and we'll see you again tomorrow. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.